Hello, G. Today is December something. It is December 10th, 2012. It is roughly 12.33 p.m. And I am recording a video on our brand new YouTube channel. Now, this is going to be a video that's a bit different from our normal ones. It's not going to be talking about our days and our lives. I am going to give you an informative video today. And it's a little known facts about history. Number one. And um, today is going to be the Irish famine. Now, as you know, well, you wouldn't know if you paid attention to my complaints. I am taking a course in the Irish famine right now. And so, yeah, I just decided to give you a little background of what I'm learning about. And see, I don't know if you're interested at all in this thing. Because, well, it, it is actually kind of interesting. Now, the famine lasted from 1845 to 1852. All right, started with the potato blight, which means um, there was like a fungus that infected the potatoes, and all of the potatoes went plonk. The reason that this is important is because the Irish had been forced onto smaller and smaller plots of land by their landlords. So each Irish family, if they were lucky, had about one fourth acre of land to plant things on. The only thing that could survive the terrible soil and that could they could grow in large amounts in that type of land was the potato. And so when the potato fails, millions of thousands of people were without food. So lots of people started, really. Next, what does this all have to do with Britain? This is where it gets interesting. Due to the Act of Union of 1800, Britain was technically Ireland's government. Yep, you heard me. So by the time that the Irish famine hit in 1845, Britain was Ireland's government. They were the ruling force of Ireland. And yet, what did they do? Nothing. Well, that's not entirely true. They did do some things. At first, Peel, who was prime minister at the time, imported Native American maize to help, you know, feed the Irish. This didn't help much. He only imported 150,000 euros of Native American maize, and over three times that much food had been lost. So, you know, they were still starving, honey. Not only that, but they couldn't um, process the maize because once they ground it, they found that it had to be ground again, and there weren't enough mills in the first place to do that. Um, so then came the work and the poorhouses. So basically, the British decided that if the Irish were going to receive any relief at all, they were going to have to work for it. So they made them walk um, a fairly good amount of miles a day, uh, sometimes up to 50, sometimes more than that miles a day. But while they were starving and they were sick to go work on physical labor, jobs that did not matter. They were literally building roads that led to nowhere. And for compensation for this, they would sometimes receive a couple pence, and that would be what they were expected to buy the food off of. There was nowhere near enough. After the workhouses and the poorhouses shut down and closed, they started making soup kitchens. I believe they started setting up the soup kitchens at the end of 48. All right? Here's the thing with soup kitchens. They were feeding 3 million people a day. All right? Because of the soup kitchens, 3 million people a day were getting nourishment. And what did the British do? After about a year, they shut it down. So that was the end of that. Because of all the death and the dying, and there was not only death but due to starvation, there was death due to sickness. There was death because people were so sick and so weak that animals were eating them. Right? Like this was not just the general, you know, I'm hungry, I'm going to die. <laughs> this was, I'm hungry and other things are eating me. And I eat two weeks to break them off. Um, a lot of emigration occurred. They went to Canada, they went to um, America, they went to South America. They went all over the place just to try to get rid or get themselves away from the negative atmosphere that was Ireland at that point in time. However, some things were completely lost. For instance, the culture of the Irish wake. Now, the Irish wake used to go on for days. It was basically not a series of mourning, but a huge celebration of the Christmas life. So it would go on for days, there was food, there was music, there was drink, people were happy, they were celebrating the person's life. 
And when the famine came, there was no food to be had. There was no drink. You know, people were getting sick and they didn't want to be around each other. And so the Irish wakened changed from celebrating someone's life to, yep, another person lost. All of a sudden it became a mourning factor. And not only that, but the Irish culture, the language itself, what started to become obsolete. So, yeah, that was basically my entire college course in about five minutes. Just, you know, in case you were wondering. Um, except the main thing that we were focusing on in the course was was the Irish gen was the Irish famine a genocide? I would like to tell you that according to my beliefs, it is not a genocide. Even though the Britain was completely responsible for the Irish and they did not do enough to um, help them live, it can't be defined as a genocide because a genocide is a purposeful act in order to exterminate a group of people. There was no proof that Britain wanted to exterminate the Irish and that they were going to do it through the famine. And so, it can't be defined as a genocide. However, I think that the definition of genocide should be changed because the phrase is saying that countries can pretty much get away with anything as long as their people are too weak to fight back. That doesn't seem right to me. So yeah, that was your little known history fact session, number one. Feel free to reply and send me something that I didn't know because, as you know, I love learning new things. Alright, I love you, and I'll talk to you later, Janie. Have a good day.